This is Theatre Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. We're kicking off the new season by talking about what's coming in and what we're excited about. Here to introduce our guests, Michael Riedel of the New York Post. And we're very happy to have a panel of theater experts with us tonight to lend us their insights into what's going to be good and what's going to be uh, terrible. Uh, on Broadway this season, we are joined tonight by David Rooney, the chief drama critic for Variety. David, welcome back to Theater Talk. Thank you. Nice to be here. Our old friend Michael Musto, the gossip columnist for The Village Voice. Welcome back. Thank you. And making his debut performance here at Theater Talk, Jesse Green, who writes the very insightful pieces for the Arts and Leisure section of The New York Times. Welcome to Theater Talk. Thank you. All right, gentlemen. Um, the big event, it seems to me, of the fall is uh, The Odd Couple with Nathan Lane and Matthew Broderick. And I was talking to uh, Manny Eisenberg, the producer of it the other day, and he said they have a $21.5 million advance, extraordinary for a play. And he said, you know, this is the first time uh, in my life I'm opening a play where I don't have to care. I don't care what The New York Times <laughs> says the next day. Mm -hmm. You're a critic, David. What's it like to be rendered impotent and irrelevant when you go in to review this show? Well, we still get to have our say regardless. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I think that everybody's going to weigh in on it, obviously. But, but clearly that is the show of the fall. I mean, with the other big commercial heavyweights of the season not coming until the spring, like... Disney's Tarzan and the Julia Roberts, um, Richard Greenberg revival, Three Days of Rain. I think that there's going to be obviously an awful lot of attention around Nathan Lane and Matthew Broderick together again after the producers. And also with Joe Mantello, you know, a director like that taking an old Neil Simon chestnut. Is he going to reinvent it? Is he going to do it straight? Is he going to do it in, in the kind of conventional way we've seen it done before? And is his hot streak going to continue? It seems Joe Mantello has had this unbroken hot streak with in the past. Wicked. Assassins. Well, I mean, I think the last six or seven shows, they've either been commercial hits or critical hits or both. Mm -hmm. So how long can he keep this going for? I mean, he's a terrific director. I'm very curious to see what he does with this. It's a good point there. I think, Jesse, if I'm not mistaken, you did an interview with uh, Joe Mantello. And he sort of came across in that interview as a dark character. I remember him saying something. He was going to give up the theater and he, take he up promised. photography. He, he promised, <laughs> but then he reneged. He reneged, yes. But that's part of his uh, charm, I think, and, and part of his... Uh, power is that he doesn't need it anymore mm -hmm. and he's he really is ready to go at any point and so people find that very attractive and he gets the top projects i mean if if you're a movie star who's going to be doing a show on broadway you're going to go to joe Mandela. julia roberts he's directing three days of rain which she will star in in the spring um i haven't seen from him though uh any attempt at um uh, directing a, a comedy do you think he in your conversations with him do you think he understands comedy a sort of neil simon comedy serious-minded guy well, he's done the Terrence Mc some Terrence McNally. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but it's true that Neil Simon is a different bird altogether. I think he approaches it all the same. The casting is an, a very important thing to him, and of course, he pretty much sewed that up. <laughs> right, right, yes. yes. Um, Michael, this play, though, The Odd Couple, um, classic play, I suppose, but do people sort of remember more the funny TV series with Klugman and uh, Randall than they do the play? And is there a danger that this play might seem a little rickety 40, 35 years later? Well, there are different, you know, first of all, this is not the first time they've done an all-female version of The Odd Couple. <laughs> they, had the one, they did the one with Sally Struthers and Rita Moreno in the 80s. Just kidding. Anyway, uh, I think the movie also is out there for everyone to remember along with the TV series. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a very dark version where Jack Lemmon is literally suicidal. I mean, mm -hmm. that takes it to deep, dark places. So I think it's going to be interesting to see where Joe Mantello takes this material. Mm -hmm. Is it just going to be a lighthearted, goofy, producer's buddy thing? Mm -hmm. Or uh, is it going to go to that suicidal place? Uh, no, that, but that was in the play initially. Can it was you really see Matthew play. Broderick, though, being a suicidal Felix? Well, maybe, you know, when I'm review, sure maybe when the reviews come out. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Matthew Broderick has colors that we are not aware of in his psyche. And it would be wonderful if Matthew Broderick would start taking roles where it, he would plumb the depths of his darker side. I think he'd be a much more interesting actor at this point. I doubt I, it's no more cute. I think it is a darker show than we remember, largely because of the TV series having... Mm -hmm lighten the tone so much. And still, we're not tired of the Matthew and Nathan show, are we, yet? Um, I was one of the naysayers about their return to the producers. I had a great time the first time I went to see it. The mm -hmm. second time, I thought it was incredibly self-indulgent, and they were playing to each other. And they'd thrown off the rhythm of the play. I thought there was an awful lot of kind of naughty behavior the second time. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think that, you know, they're coming in fresh to a new production now. I think it's going to be an entirely different kettle of fish. It's a good point, though, to watch that because I think there is a danger of them. They're so comfortable with each other and they do have a good time together mm -hmm. that I think the minute they start to get bored, uh, they could 
play around with things. Well, they do that Carol Burnett show thing where let's see if we can crack each other up. And I really don't think Neil Simon, who's quite a taskmaster, is yeah, going yeah. to stand for that. They're not going to be able to vary from that script one bit, no matter how famous they are and how big they are at the if box If Neil office. Simon could flatten Mary Tyler Moore, he could oh. flatten Nathan Lane and Matthew Broderick. <laughs> it barely matters because no one who doesn't have their tickets already is going to see it. Yeah. And um, they're not playing it that long that they can get that bored with it. Yeah, that's true. I guess I'm not going to see it. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, we've got another big um, um, name coming to Broadway, although she's not in the show, but she's above the title. Uh, Oprah Winfrey has put a million dollars into uh, The Color Purple. Um, David, uh, are people going to buy tickets just because Oprah Winfrey's name is above the title? Well, I think it's a tough question, and it's going to be very curious to see how it pans out because, you know, Obviously, a million dollars for her is lunch money. Yeah, that's mm. junk change. She is really lending her brand to this show. And if she, you know, obviously she's going to get the cast on the show to do a number. Um, if she chooses then to push it also in her magazine, maybe the Alice Walker novel will become a book club choice. There are all kinds ah, of what possibilities. What do you mean, maybe? <laughs> I think that's in the offing. Yeah, mm. and, and that brand works. Actually, that brand functions as an endorsement. There are a lot of people who, you know, see Oprah's name on a book, go out and buy it. They'll read a magazine, uh, read a magazine article and think, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting show. So everyone automatically thought that it would mean getting that elusive, upscale black audience that went to see Raisin in the Sun that, that are not traditionally big Broadway ticket buyers. Mm -hmm. But... Um, the smart thinking seems to be that, that that would be gravy, that the real audience is middle American white women. And if they start planning their trips from Kansas to New York to see Color Purple, that could make a big difference to the box office here. Mm -hmm. I mean, do, you, do you think, though, that her audience, Michael, is a real theater-going audience? I mean, I know it's a vast audience, but I, I don't know. Look, I looked at some of the demographics for that show, and these don't strike me as people who come to New York all that much or go to see that many Broadway shows. I think there will become a theater-going audience. And let's face it, is Oprah going to do her telecast about In the Life or what is it, In, <laughs> in My Life or, or you know, uh, Edward Albee's Seascape? Or is she going to do telecasts about The Color Purple? She is going to batter her audience with shows about The Color Purple until they become theater-going people. Uh -huh. And this could either be another ragtime, uh, sort of an underrated classic for the ages, or it could just be totally turgid. But I do think it's going to find an audience. Let's just say, Jesse, for the sake of argument, that it's turgid. Uh, does <laughs> Oprah then go out, she has this enormous trust build up with her audience, does she then go out and sell them on a show that, you know, the critics didn't like? Yes. She does. <laughs> Shamelessly. Absolutely. Why not? Wouldn't you if you were a producer? I mean, she's doing it, she, as you say, the money is chump change to her. She believes in it. Of course she's going to do it. And the show isn't turgid. It isn't. Now, oh, you yeah, saw he, a run-through of it uh, I did over see the a run-through of it. It's, a, it's, a, it's difficult material to wrestle into any shape other than the original shape. The movie, many people felt, didn't really work very well. And uh, you, you can't overcome the fact that it takes place over many, many years, and it's told in letters. Mm -hmm. It's not exactly easy to do, but Marsha Norman is a fine playwright, and I was more impressed than I expected to be, and I think a lot of people will be pretty surprised. Now, when you were there, uh, Oprah's sort of uh, right-hand uh, woman was, uh, was there, too. Her What's whole her court name? was there. Her whole court, yes. Yes, Gail King and mm -hmm. uh, Amy Gross, who edits the magazine, and uh, they were, I saw tears in all their eyes. But <laughs> Oprah herself has not seen this, do we, do we know? Oprah no. gets reports. <laughs> from, from the staff. Um, all right. Well, it'll be interesting to see how it uh, to see how that that plays out. I am not convinced, though, that just because you put the celebrity's name ab above the show as a producer, people will buy tickets. Well, hey, all it, those people who buy. I mean, Rosie O'Donnell it trying to make for, it worked for taboo. Yeah, for oh. <laughs> <laughs> but all those people who buy Thigh Masters on the Home Shopping Network don't didn't go see Suzanne Somers. So. I agree with because you that she put herself on the stage. Oprah's being smart enough <laughs> yeah. to put other people. <laughs> it's not enough to do it. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Just from speaking from a reporter's uh, perspective, it's time to. That, I don't think the tickets have gone on sale yet, or they haven't had a big push yet. But it'll be very interesting to me to see what that what that advance sale is. What Oprah can bring that advance sale up to. Um, which well, once the ads come out saying not horrible, I think, you know, that's all you <laughs> That's it. There'll be a run for the <laughs> That's office. it. Um, we have uh, a great old Broadway veteran coming back, Cheetah Rivera, um, uh, following in the uh, uh, path of Elaine Stritch, doing a one, uh, not a one woman show, but a show about her life filled out with some dancers behind her. Um, the only concern I think here is that Elaine Stritch was such a wonderful, salty, tough character, and Cheetah is a great and performer. still is. And still is, yeah. Uh, Cheetah's a great performer, but frankly, um, a little bit bland, I found in interviews. Do you think the danger here is blandness in Cheetah's show, David? I would hope not. I mean, I think she's, she's surrounded herself with some pretty talented people, and, 
you know, Terrence McNally has proven in the in recent years, especially that you know his real strength is as a book writer for musicals. And okay, this isn't a traditional musical, but getting somebody on board like McNally to shape all of her reminiscences into some kind of narrative, I think, was a good move. I mean, she has a couple of new songs by Aronson Flaherty, who who can be interesting. Um, you know, I think the show is open to reasonably good response in San Diego this week, and obviously they'll keep working on it and refining it till it gets here. You know, she she has this kind of legend quality about her, and I think people are going to want to go see her. You know, just to hear Cheetah Rivera talk about working with Fosse and other choreographers, I think is going to be the, the real thing. Whether people are interested in her upbringing and the, the background before Broadway. The affair with Sammy Davis Jr. Yeah. and Joe Allen and all that sort of thing. That's another thing. But, you know, whether it all hangs together as a show, but I do think it's going to work. I think people are going to want to go see her automatically. It's also much less book than than dance performance. I mean, it's... it's Did you go in to see this one, too? Uh, no, but I... <laughs> <laughs> you, you they they secreted me into the, into the West Coast in a box, and I watched from backstage. <laughs> um, no, they, but I, I've seen... I know what it is. It's, yeah. There's a, a dozen numbers in it. I mean, it's, it's not dependent in the way Elaine, Stritch, you know, Elaine Stritch's show was on just her kind of ad lib narrative or semi ad lib narrative. It's there's a lot of musical numbers and they're classic musical Who's numbers. Who's doing the choreography? Graciela Danielle. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, and in some cases or in most cases uh, with the older material trying to recreate, recreate exactly Robbins's choreography or Fosse's or, or whoever's and uh, you know I think that's going to carry the show pretty well even if the other issues don't and and you're right she doesn't she's not a nasty bitchy kind of star She's not going to tell the, right. She's not going <laughs> to tell those Elaine Stritch stories on the nasty people she had affairs with. I don't think you'll hear those stories in the show, and that will be a disappointment to some insiders. But I think uh, instead she's going to be telling nostalgic stories about working with Gwen Verdon, and, and there's probably just as much of an audience for that. No way. I got to ask you that, Michael. I mean, <laughs> besides you and your friends there, I mean, what's the audience for you know Gwen Ver uh, or, or Joe Allen story? I don't even care. Cheetah no, Ramirez I'm kidding. Ramirez I'm kidding. about Gwen Verdon. I mean, well, who she's cares a, anymore? Cheetah is just delectable, and I once asked her about Jerome Robbins. You know, it, it, was he the bastard that everyone said? Remember in. Um, What's her name from uh, Golden Girls? B. Arthur's one man show. She yeah. made some horrible <laughs> <One -man> show. <laughs> <laughs> little slip there. <laughs> uh, she made some remark about uh, how everybody rejoiced when he died, and Cheetah was horrified. She said, "Oh no, he was a taskmaster, but he was a wonderful person." And she's not going to dish anybody. That's the truth. But I think she has some two hours of, "Oh no, he was a wonderful person." I mean, I'm get, yeah, no, but two hours of someone the age of your mother getting up there and dancing up a storm the way you know our mothers probably can't move at this point is pretty remarkable. Mm. Uh, you know, for My sense is I think that uh, the critics and the theater press is just going to cut her a lot of slack. Even if they're somewhat indifferent to it, I think there's love for her and who's going to come out and bash Cheetah Rivera. I think you're right. However, I bash Bernadette Peters, so you know, there are no sacred cows. <laughs> you think so? You're going to go as a critic in there? Think, no, I don't think I'll go in there you know, prepared to be soft on it. But you know, I do think people are going to say, well, she's been around a long time. She's paid her dues. They're not, they're not going to savage her. You know, if she... If our high kicks are not as smooth as they should be, people are not going to tear her down for that. I think mm. they are going to cut us some slack. Mm. Uh, do you think the critics will cut uh, Patty Lapone with her tuba and meat cleaver much slack in Sweeney Todd, Jesse? I think they'd better. <laughs> <laughs> or she'll hit them with the tuba. Given what you just described. Well, you know, it's an, it's, it's an odd thing that that show ended up on Broadway at all in the, this teeny Todd, as they call it, yeah. uh, and in a moderately large theater. I mean, some of the performers in it have told me that they feel like they're the National Theater of Poland that somebody made a horribly <laughs> wrong booking for. Um, but I, I wouldn't, you know, again, I don't, I'm not in a position to pre prejudge these things. The production in London was universe, pretty much universally loved. Did you see it? I did not. I, they did. The box went the wrong direction. I ended up <laughs> in the wrong place get you at that time. Um, and I think the cast is excellent, and everybody's been waiting for Patty Lapone to come back to Broadway, now, perhaps so that they can savage her. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I think. People will be quite interested in what she does in the role, and the tuba is just a nice little uh, additional fun. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen a lot of C Stephen Sondheim revivals of late that have all failed. I mean, again, are we talking about something where the audience is just too limited for these things now? 
Possibly, and I think it's sad that he can't get a new musical on Broadway, though In My Life is coming. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> how did that happen? But uh, he only exists in terms of revivals now, it seems, and they're always scaled-down revivals. And some of us remember the grandiose original productions. The original Sweeney Todd was just a marvel, mm -hmm. and Angela Lansbury could not be top. That's one of the most indelible characterizations of all time mm -hmm. in musical theater. But now everything's like, bring it down. And even the barber, Michael Severus, doesn't even have hair. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, like, <laughs> it's, it's totally revisionist. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, Patti LuPone gets a lot of flack from critics. Nobody likes anything she does. I think she's great. Yes. So I'm looking forward. I would have preferred Cindy Lauper, who was up for the role, and I think it would have been like some kind of revelation, possibly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, David, it's true what Michael says. It seems to me that every time they come along with a uh, scaled-down production, you critics you know, uh, acclaim it as... Uh, uh, a revisionary thinking of, of well, the I, show. I did see this production in oh, London, you did? yeah, you and it it is a reinvention. I mean, it's it's all reimagined as a kind of fever dream of Toby in the asylum, and oh, it's all staged <laughs> a little Victorian apothecary. No, I know it sounds dire, and I went along very skeptical, but it's actually pretty terrific. And the the thing that disturbs me a little bit about it here is what worked so well in London is that there were no stars. Mrs. Lovett was somebody who looked like she'd been pulling pints in a bar on Coronation Street in a, <laughs> in a sort of tarty leather skirt and she'd whip out a trumpet, not a, trump, uh, not a tuba there. She was mm -hmm. playing trumpet. Um, and it worked very well because they were very much at the, in the service of the show right. and they were all playing their instruments. It sounds authentic too. I mean, yeah, these are the it, creatures of this uh, part of London. There's a nice kind of funky, not quite refined feel to it. There right. certainly was in London anyway. Whether they'll slick it up for Broadway, I don't know. But the other interesting thing in London was that Sweeney was the only person on stage who doesn't play an instrument and it gave him a certain authority, a certain gravitas. And I'm wondering if you know, Michael Severus whipping out a fender and thrashing away at that is going to change the dynamic of the show a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, or trombone, my God, it could be the music man chopping people up. Uh, I don't know, I'm skeptical of it. Uh, very weak advanced sales for it. I don't think Steve Sondheim's name goes beyond the uh, musical theater loving crowd anymore. Maybe it never did. Well, we've seen Sweeney Todd and we've seen it and we've seen it. There was a scaled down revival in the 80s with yeah. Beth Fowler. Yeah. So. This doesn't seem terribly revolutionary. All right, now we're going to get to a show that you seem to be chomping at the bit to uh, <laughs> go for. Um, every now and then on Broadway, you get these kind of odd things, these shows, vanity productions, I think you could call them, where they're written, directed, produced by one man. In this case, it's uh, Joe Brooks, the man who wrote You Light Up My Life and the Dr. Pepper jingle. Uh, and uh, with that resume, he's come up with a uh, musical in my life. Now, Michael, you went to a uh, dog and pony show, and I, I heard you were It's impressed. a dog, all right. <laughs> no, <laughs> Forget I'm kidding. We're not allowed what to review this. What is this about this. Uh, this in is, my life? It was supposedly about a writer from the Village Voice, of all places, with OCD, <laughs> but that was erroneous, as Jessica Beavers, who plays the part, later Jessica said. Jessica Bovers. Oh, I confused her with somebody in Playboy. <laughs> uh, and she falls in love with um, a guy, a musician, I guess, with Tourette syndrome. So I expect a dialogue like, I love you, you bleeping, bleeping. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's much more surreal than that because as we learned at the preview, it's framed as a, as God is producing the first rock opera, reality rock opera in heaven. And so that frames the story of these two ill people. The guy with Tourette's turns out to also have a brain tumor, not to give away the plot. <laughs> and, and the tone kind of <laughs> veers between very wacky, welcome to heaven kind of songs with these very treacly, you know, love story and, and with a sad uh, finish. So it's like, I'm a pepper, you're a pepper, and you light up my life, that kind of style of uh, stuff? If you like. If you like. <laughs> uh, are we going to be reading a, the 2,000 word uh, essay by you in the Arts and Leisure section on the Joe Brooks? Surprisingly, yes. <laughs> I would know. I was very interested in what does it take to think enough of your abilities to take on all those responsibilities and then Good throw question. it up on Broadway. Mm -hmm. well, throw yeah, it up might not be the right <laughs> phrase, but um, mount it. No, that's not quite good either. That's right. uh, so ye yes, you will. And I, uh, one thing that should be said in his behalf. Uh, it's very little to say. Uh, he did not actually put up the money for it. Everyone thinks it's his money. Mm -hmm. It is not. I don't know if it's saying something that the person who did put up the money will not allow his name to be used. Right. <laughs> However, um, you know, what he did, you know, it, it's when, when a genius does what he does, we think, oh, how wonderful, right. because the product is worth it. And you'll have to judge from the product whether it was worth it in this case. But I don't think you can say just because he's doing all these things that immediately marks it as a failure. Um, perhaps the music and lyrics and book will mark it as a failure. People will judge that. The visual presentation won't mark it as a failure. It's top notch. Mm -hmm. he, he 
got top designers to build this show. And well, there's no expense looking. spared, though, on this show. No uh, expense spared. It's a beautiful-looking show. I can tell you, he's paying... There are some cast members in that show, and none of them are famous, but a couple of them are earning $6,000 a week. It's a very big salary to pay Don't people. Don't let the roundabout <laughs> your casts hear about that. You're a critic. You're, you'll be objective about it. But, I mean, let's be honest. Everybody in the industry is kind of snickering at this show. You've got to pick that up. Does it color you at all when you go in? I mean, is this the kind of thing where you're sharpening the knives for because, you know, you can write a review that everyone's going to be chuckling at the next day? It's, you know, no one's going to deny those reviews are not fun to write. They come very easily as well, you know. Um, you know, it's great to talk up a wonderful show, but something that deserves to be taken down, it's fun to write about. You know, I had a great time writing about the Suzanne Somers show. <laughs> here's, a guy, here's a guy, he was a genius in his, in his you know, which is writing uh, jingles for, as you say, Pepsi and Dr. Pepper and American Airlines and all that. So apparently it's been his dream all his life to come to Broadway and do a musical. Whether he's paying for it or not, he can scrape up the money to do it. And, and, and they rent the theater and, you know, hire the help. And it's sort of going to come and go. And it's not worth savaging. It's, if it's wonderful, fine. But otherwise, um, Broadway does lend itself to this nowadays, that you can almost be a private production and fulfill your dream. Well, it's interesting, though, a, a point sort of larger issue about Broadway now, thinking about the people who are producing. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me... Um, for a while, we were talking about how the corporation was going to take over Broadway. Clear Channel is going to run everything. And they're really Im they're imploding as we speak. It seems to me, though, that instead of the corporation that's taken over Broadway, there's been the rise of these incredibly rich people, richer than ever before on Broadway. I mean, the Roth family, Daryl Roth, Steve Roth, uh, and their son Jordan, who is now going to be go, uh, I understand, go to work for Jujamson Theaters. And there's mm -hmm. talk that the Roths are going to buy half of one of the third largest theater owning chain on Broadway. The super rich have taken over this business. It's become a rich person's club, do you think? And does that allow them to indulge their crazy Well, ideas? much as in politics, which has over the years uh, attracted more and more peculiar people because of the money necessary, you're going to get many more idiosyncratic producers and productions as a result of this trend, which I think is absolutely true. Mm -hmm. You still have the traditional producers, but even they have to join up with thousands of other people. The joke in uh, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels with the list of the producers, there, you know, was half the playbill. Right. Um, and that's often real. In this, in my life, uh, there is one producer. Every cent came from him, even though we don't know who he is. <laughs> Have you been able to suss this out yet? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we'll uh, eagerly read your piece and you'll tell us who. But um, it, it's a danger because, uh, it can be a danger because that kind of person may have bad taste, yep. v very possibly will have bad taste, or at any rate eccentric taste. On the other hand, again, just being rich doesn't mean you have bad taste, and some very rich people will put up a lot of money like the Roths do for some pretty good shows. Yeah, that's I true. think people start to bet also that, you know, the logistics of producing being what they are, every show now needs 15, 19 producers. So if you see a show with one producer above the title, the suspicion goes out immediately that it's a vanity production. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting, though. I was talking to a couple of these uh, super rich producers, and they told me that they're going to start producing stuff pretty much just with their own money. I mean, they have that much money. We're talking about people who have 500, 600, 700 million dollars, in some cases a billion or more dollars, because it's just easier to do it yourself rather than have to go to these meetings with 15 other rich people fighting over what color the ad is going to be and how, how, how large the numbers for the phone uh, 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 number are going to be on, on the poster. But when that, when that works, that will be all to the better. When it doesn't work, you'll have certain kinds of shows that we can all laugh at. But... Um, but that's all I can do. <laughs> uh, we only have a minute left. Can you sort of give us a sense of one thing you're looking forward to, maybe off-Broadway, something going on, going on off-Broadway that you're keeping your eye on this season? Can I just do a Broadway thing? I'm actually sure. looking forward to the revival of Edward Albee's Seascape, not just he Seascape, mind you, uh, because I always found that reptile so much sexier than the goat. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's a play that, though it won the Pulitzer in its time, didn't really find an audience. And I think if they reinvent it, maybe scale it down, make them play tubas, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> with those lizards scaling it down. Lizards playing tubas, gonna be I don't know. I'm just looking forward to suits. seeing what they do with it. And if, if Frederick Weller as the lizard will do as good a job <laughs> as Frank Langella did. You know, that's actually quite a good play, Seascape. The first, I think, act of it is what interesting all be look at a marriage again. Then the second act is when you get into evolution and the lizards and it becomes a lot. Something that you're keeping your eye on? Uh, Shining City, which was dropped right. at first uh, when the Weislers had it. I don't know why. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> was more right. Fun. What is it? Uh, it's a, an import of a British play that's terrific. Uh, Connor McPherson. Connor McPherson. Oh, it's it's sort of in the, you know, now that Pillow Man got out of town with its 
golden penny intact, <laughs> yeah, right. uh, a lot of the kind of scary British imports are coming in, and this is maybe the best of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that it, it fell apart with the Weisslers because Barry Weisler had a huge fight with Conor McPherson. One of the issues was what hotel he was going to stay in. Because if I know the Weisslers, they wanted to put him in the Best Western on West 57th <laughs> Street, and he wanted something a little better. Uh, David? Well, I'm also looking forward to Shining City very much. And, um, you know, I think on paper, it looks like there may be, you know, two or three decent plays this season. I mean, I'm looking forward to the David Lindsay Bear play, which has a good cast. What's that called? Rabbit Hole. Rabbit Hole. With yeah. Cynthia Nixon, Tyne Daly, and uh, John Slattery, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I know it's not the fall, but I'm very excited to see the Alan Bennett play again, The History Boys, yes. which I saw at the National, and it's really one of the best plays of the last year, coming with that fantastic cast. I am second you. That, that's but a I, I terrific understand play. Oprah is getting it's behind <laughs> it, and it's going to really... <laughs> All right, listen, thanks for letting us your insights, guys. David Rooney from Variety, Michael Musto from The Village Voice, Jesse Green from The New York Times. A nice debut here on Theatre Talk. Hope Thank you'll you. come back. Thank you. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. Playbill Online is the official website of Theater Talk and the home of the Playbill Club, providing information and opportunities for theater lovers. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. Mm -hmm.